Welcome to this episode of Testable Faith. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which sponsors this particular program. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, go to our website, www.reasons.org. And I'm joined today in studio by Abdu Murray, who is a Christian apologist, heads up the organization Embrace the Truth, and is also someone who is trained as a lawyer who has practiced law. And Abdu is going to talk to us about how legal principles can be useful as we make a case for the Christian faith. So Abdu, thanks for being here with us. Good to be here, Fuzz, always. So uh, what I oftentimes see when I see interactions between Christians and skeptics Mm -hmm. has to do with who owns the burden of proof. And, And so... Your perspective as a lawyer, I think, could be really valuable yeah. to help move that those conversations forward in a productive way. Yeah. So first of all, maybe let's just start with a definition. What What is really meant by burden of proof mm-hmm. in a legal context or maybe even in just a general yeah. conversational context? Yeah, so in, I'll go with the general conversational context first and then maybe apply the legal stuff because I think that will help us to, to shape and frame... What are the stakes at? Uh, what are the things that are at uh, at stake when we have these conversations? So, certainly, the burden of proof is just who has to who has to bring evidence that justifies a claim. So that really goes right toward who has the burden of proof. Now, in everyday conversations, the person who sta- makes the statement bears the burden of proving that statement. So, if I were to say the Bible is God's word, now I have the burden of proving that. But if you if we were just having a conversation and you knew I was a Christian, and you say, look, the Bible's not reliable. It has historical inaccuracies. It's got um, all kinds of contradictions. I didn't say that. You said that. You're the, you bear the burden of proof. Why this is important is because Christians oftentimes in their zeal to, to defend a book that's meant so much to them will rush to say, no, it doesn't. And, and they, they start to tell you why it doesn't have contradictions or why it's historically reliable. Well, the Christian is not in that, po- that particular moment bearing the burden of proof. The person who made the claim, whether it's an objection or a positive case, bears the burden of making that, of proving it. So the, 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 the shortest way I can think of to say it is the person who makes the statement bears the burden of proving the statement. Yeah. And that's a, just a general idea. Now, in a court of law, um, you have, in a criminal case, you have the prosecution and you have the defendant. And in a civil case, you have the plaintiff who brings the case and the defendant. Um, in both of those instances, technically speaking, the defendant has no burden. Um, uh, in a criminal case, the prosecution bears the burden of proving a case beyond a reasonable doubt, and they go first in a, in a trial. They present their case first. Um, the defense has a case in chief second, and but technically speaking, they don't have to do it because they have no burden. They say the prosecution didn't do its job. Your Honor, I move for a directed verdict because the jury shouldn't even be hearing this anymore and because they haven't met their burden. That's how, that, that's how it could go. In a, in a civil case, the plaintiff puts on a case and the defendant can put on a case in chief. But technically speaking, the defendant doesn't actually have to prove anything. And you can say, you didn't do your job. Um, and I want a directed verdict on that, that end, that end too. That's one way to look at it. The reality, though, is that in a court of law, in almost every case, if the prosecution or the plaintiff puts on their case and they have a certain level of burden of proof, and it's different from civil cases to criminal cases, let's say a criminal case, the prosecution has the burden of bearing, uh, of saying that the defendant is guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. Not beyond all doubt, beyond reasonable doubt. And the question is, did the prosecution put out enough evidence to suggest or to to give the the, the jury a conviction, a firm conviction, that there's no reasonable doubt that defendant X or whatever did it? If they don't do that, the defense can technically stop. But no defense lawyer really stops because something did happen. Someone did die. Someone was murdered or, you know, someone was assaulted or whatever it happens to be. And the jury wants to know how that happened. They want an explanation for the undisputed facts. Like, this happened. This person is dead. Was it an accident or did someone do it? They want to know. And most defense lawyers in most cases, and any good defense lawyer in most cases would say, you can't just say the prosecution didn't meet its burden. You have to explain some things. Because the prosecution pretty much puts on a case that requires some explanation of some stuff. And maybe you have a good one. 
but no lawyer will say, I don't need to. You didn't meet your burden. Try again. They'll never, they'll never do that because the jury wants to know what happened. And so while technically the burden isn't on the defense, the defense will take on the burden of providing an alternate explanation because it knows the jury wants to know what happened, even in a civil case that happens as well. How that applies, I think, in common conversations on God and skeptics is you'll often hear the claim from an atheist or a skeptic is like, I don't have a burden. I lack belief in God's existence, so I don't have a burden to prove my lack of belief. You have the burden of proving your, your, your worldview. Um, I find that to be, one, not practical, and I find it also to be um, just I – don't, I don't even think intellectually – rigorous thinking. It's just like, try again, try again. Well, if it doesn't work in a court of law, the jury wants to know what happened. So if you and I were talking, and I was a skeptic, and I said that to you, and there's a third person sitting at the table, and they're open-minded about this whole thing. They're agnostic in, in, in a true sense. And they hear me say, no, try again, no, try again. And you're putting on a, a case where some explanation needs to happen, um, and they hear me say, no, try again. They're not going to be satisfied with my lack of case. Yeah. They're going to want to say, well, how do you explain yeah. the origin of life. How do you explain that you need proteins before you have DNA, but in order to have proteins, you have to have DNA? How do you explain that? How do you explain all this stuff and the complex systems he's talking about and the way in which there's something built into the system that cries for explanation, just like the death of some, some person cries for an explanation. So burdens of proof exist, I think, not just to say the positive case needs to be made, but sometimes we have to explain what the positive case doesn't actually lead to what it's at. So these are important in all, 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 all realms. Yeah, well, and just practically speaking, I've engaged skeptics where they, they raise an objection mm -hmm. and then, you know, in, in good faith, I try to respond to that objection. Yeah. And oftentimes it's just, well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. Yeah. And it's very easy to get caught into that trap where you're just chasing after uh, an ex, you know, a, yeah. a defense where you know that by that, that this person now is just not going to be satisfied with anything yeah. that you present. Mm -hmm. So I think it seems to me like that shifting the burden of proof, or at least recognizing that they own the burden of proof as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you know, is is very critical. Even if it's just simple questions like, well, why, you know, why do you, are you saying that? What you What's know, not good enough about it? What, what, what would you need? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I've, I've found this to be the case oftentimes. It's like, and I often have this question I've often asked. Now, it's not a burden of proof question expressly, but it implies a burden of proof question. Someone says there's not enough evidence. Well, what would qualify as evidence? Yeah. I mean, I've had that conversation with people, and it's like, well, it has to be at this level. Well, why that level? Um, why couldn't it just be this level? Right. Um, uh, especially given the stakes involved, where lack of belief would have a much higher consequence than belief would have. Right. So why would you need me to prove it, to, prove it, to, to provide something beyond a burden when believing me doesn't really hurt you? It only helps you. But, yeah. but me believing you could cause my eternal damnation. Yeah. So it seems to me that the person who had the highest burden of proof is you yeah. because your lack of belief has tremendous consequences. Now, this is not a Pascal's wager kind of a thing. Right. This is more about understanding of where the onus actually lies because we have to be real about what we're talking about here. Right. We're not talking about intellectual curiosities only. We're talking about intellectual curiosities that lead to, 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 to verities about right. the world we live in and, our, and the eternal consequences of those beliefs. So in, in a legal system, in a trial, depending on the nature of, of the trial, if mm -hmm. it's a civil case versus a a criminal case, and, mm -hmm. and let's say it's a murder trial, mm -hmm. obviously having, you know, for a conviction to have a very high burden of proof yeah. on, for the prosecution makes sense in a criminal trial yeah. versus a civil, civil trial because not as much is at stake for the loser. That's exactly right. That's right. exactly right. And so this is a, the, the point that you're making, mm -hmm. you know, about the, the, the consequences of, mm -hmm. of, of not accepting the burden of proof if yeah. you are a non-believer, let's say. Yeah. So when you look at the, the three different burdens of proof, uh, and there are slight variations within these things uh, themselves, but you have a preponderance of the evidence. So in most civil cases, preponderance of the evidence is simply, uh, and they probably try to quantify it, but it's like, um, has someone proven it? So that's more likely than not that this happened or that person's liable or whatever it might be. 
So it's more likely than not. So it's like think of like forty nine percent to fifty one percent, or even fifty point one percent could be mm-hmm. could even be the even be the standard. Um, I analogize it to sports. So my favorite team, Michigan Wolverines, uh, they play the Ohio State Buckeyes, um, and let's say they win uh, eighty one to eighty. That's a preponderance of the evidence kind of a thing. Right. But let's say they play the Buckeyes and they win one hundred and one to eighty. Okay, that's the second level of burden of proof, which is um, the great weight of the evidence. Um, and in certain kind of civil cases, that's what happens. You have a higher level. Like fraud cases require a great weight of the evidence kind of a standard. Uh, certain other kinds of civil cases that might involve statutory um, violations require that because the consequences are high yeah. because there's treble damages involved. You know, if you hit me with a car and you injure me, there might be high right. consequences uh, or low, but the, the insurance companies are involved, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you, you know, say something and you defame me, it might be one thing. And have some consequences, but if like, frauds involved or copyright violations or whatever it is, right. sometimes the damages get trebled, and so there's consequences. And we want to be able to say you have to prove at a much higher level because the consequences are greater. In a, in a criminal case, as you just pointed out, someone's freedom or life is at stake. So we want the prosecution to have the highest burden possible, which is a, beyond a reasonable mm-hmm. doubt. We also want it because we, what we don't want is the government basically running roughshod over people. So there's a, that, that as well. So we hide, hold them to the highest possible standard as well. So in our conversations with our atheist friends, if I provided a case for the Christian faith and they want to say that's not good enough, I would suggest that in that moment the burden of proof for me, is preponderance of the evidence because the consequences of me being right mm. are positive. The consequences of me being wrong are non-existent. We're just, I'm just gonna, not going not gonna to exist. So, and I won't know that. Uh, it's oblivion. That's what that waits for me, whether I, if, if I'm wrong. But for the atheist, if the consequences of them being right are my oblivion or their oblivion, who cares? If the consequences are eternal separation from God's love, that's pretty high. So yeah. the burden, when it does shift, it shifts on them. And so mine stays at preponderance. Theirs stays at reasonable doubt, at least. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's very helpful. Um, uh, any, anything else that you'd have about the burden of proof that um, mm. that would be helpful in, in conversations? Just a reminder to um, don't necessarily be so key to take the burden of proof upon yourself. Okay. Be mindful of your conversations that when it, when it is yours, try to meet it. And when it's not, let the other person try to meet right. it. It can be uncomfortable sometimes to watch somebody sort of squirm through it. But you know what? It's good for both of you. These things are not chess matches. Um, these things are conversations about mm-hmm. eternal consequences. And so we're not trying to win the conversation or win the case. But these principles help us to have real, honest conversations. So don't think of it as a court case. Don't think of it as a chess match, but do think of it in terms of why the burdens of proof exist and why it matters for a very personal conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Abdu. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching this episode of Testable Faith. Uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, reasons.org, and search Abdu Murray and you'll get access to a whole host of resources that Abdu has created for us at Reasons to Believe, resources that are going to be very helpful to you, that are going to bless you. So until next time, take care.